This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Your war room for insider news and draft analysis from deep within the confines of Cowboys headquarters at the Star in Frisco. Today is Tuesday, March 9th, 2024, and we are officially 37 days away from the NFL Draft in Detroit, Michigan. Welcome into the Draft Show, presented by Miller Lite, live from the Star in Frisco, Texas, inside the SWBC studios. We have Zach Wolchuk, Nick Harris, Brian Broaddus, making her triumphant return, Aisha Morrison. I'm Kyle Yeomans. Glad you're with us. Chris Beam running everything in the back. 37 days. March 19th by the way. What did I say? You said March 9th, but it's fine. You know, just for the... Uh, you know, the, the one and the nine. Yeah, hey, the OCD you know. You're dealing right. with a lot, bro. It's whatever. I, I get it. Like, whatever. One, nine, nine three, you know. Nine, nine teeth. Kyle and I barely <laughs> slept. It's yeah. not a big deal. Yeah, it's not, yeah. Everything good? Everything's good. Are you good. doing all right? I'm good, man. Nick, we, we failed to box everybody out for a second. <laughs> yeah. Show. yeah, how are our babies doing hey, today, guys? Hey, the babies good, are good. Baby, we're good. Babies yeah. are doing all right. Everybody's great. solid. How are your babies good over there? <laughs> that side of the table? Yeah. Okay. One of them's down here. He's okay, there we go. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah, he's he's here too. So That's let's, good. let's talk about our draft babies. Let's talk about draft babies. <laughs> oh my god. They do become our children. I'm kind never of gonna refer to them as that ever again. <laughs> All, All right, right. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and refrain. <laughs> Thirty-seven days away, Brian. Pro days are in full effect. Yeah, what's what's this time of year really feel like for those scouts across the hall? Well, they're trying to figure out right now. They're trying to kind of run down some of the numbers they didn't get at the combine. There were a lot of players that didn't do uh, the did the, uh, the 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 like the the shuttles and things like that. The three cones, things that they need to kind of fill in on their boards. Uh, and also, this is the opportunity, too, for these coaches to get out and look at these players and work them out themselves. They saw them at the Combine. They saw them work out there. Now they physically get to put hands on these guys and kind of work them through the drills and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, you get your 30 visits coming up. That'll be probably the 1st of April. So they're going to knock out all these pro days, and then they're going to come back and they're going to start putting this board together. But it's an important time for those guys. A lot of pressure on these players that didn't work out at the Combine. You know, now you're putting – kind of all your eggs in one basket, and you're saying, okay, here we go. We're going to have a pro day for you. And if you, you know, say you run a, a slow time, I know there's uh, some thought about Lassiter, the corner from Georgia, uh, didn't run a particularly great time at his pro day. And so now the worry of when you don't run at the combine and then you run at your pro day and you don't have a particularly fast time, you're running out of days to kind of make that up. So a lot of guys, uh, kind of a lot of stress going on out there, but – Scouts trying to get all their numbers together. The coaches are trying to get an idea about working these guys out. Yeah, it feels like these pro days are the final opportunity to add yeah. data into yeah. these guys and be able to build context before uh, you bring them in for 30 visits. Um, those 30 visits happening w- between now and April for, for for certain teams. Sounds like the Cowboys more so April, but um, th- th- that'll be the true final opportunity to get an opportunity to see who these guys are off the field and what, what they can learn or what they can show as far as on the whiteboard. And they yeah. do a lot as far as putting those guys in certain situations. And they really test them in those rooms. And it's it's mentally taxing. I couldn't imagine doing 30 30 of them over the course of a weekend. But, um, yeah, th- that's going to be a really fun weekend. And then after that, it's draft time, baby. Some of the pre-March 19th pro days there you go. that have already been in the books, Texas A&M, Miami, Iowa, uh, Colorado State, who has a couple prospects on both sides of the ball, Penn State, UCLA, Clemson, Arizona, Minnesota, Georgia, like Brian said, Arkansas, yeah. Michigan State, some of the ones, Oklahoma, some of the ones that are coming up to today, Holy Toledo and Wyoming, the fight in Barry Churches. Also today. Uh, yeah. Texas A&M, okay, this list says yesterday. But the Alabama one tomorrow, Texas is tomorrow, Ooh, USC is I'll tomorrow. There. Nick Harris will be out at the Texas Pro Day in Ohio State. So a big day rolling into Wednesday this week. And lots of, uh, lots of things to look forward to on the Pro Day slate. What are you looking forward to tomorrow? Yeah, I'm really excited to see all those guys that they have. Uh, you talk about to Andre Sweat, Byron Murphy, uh, Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Worthy. I mean, there's some really talented guys down there at Texas. But uh, one guy that I'm really excited to see, and we talked about him a little bit off the show um, last week, Kyle, was uh, Jordan Whittington. 
um, mm-hmm. a receiver for them that they brought in in uh, the class of 2019. They expected him to be a feature guy right off the bat. Battled injury for his first three years, but eventually was able to build stability as far as his health goes over the course of the last two seasons. And unfortunately, Texas just kind of had to recruit over him and bring in Xavier Worthy, bring in A.D. Mitchell. So he may not have the uh, statistics that you know some of these uh, other receivers will have in the class, but I think once he runs tomorrow, he's going to impress a lot of people. I think he's going to drop a really impressive time given his size. I have a question um, for you folks. So you uh, brought up Lassiter, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. uh, Brian. So at one point in time, like say he doesn't run a good 40 time. At right. His pro day. Right. But when you see him on film, his transitions are smooth. Yeah. yeah. The timing yeah. is there and the everything. Speed doesn't seem to be an issue when you watch. Yeah. It doesn't. And that's one thing that I struggle with, with, you know, looking deeper into these players is like, putting a value on these combine pro days, but then also understanding, like, some players just – I mean, you teach – these kids learn how to test. A lot of them test well because they have done, you know, the necessary preparation to test. But I'm just going to ask you guys, how do you decipher, you know, where this guy really belongs or whatever if you're looking at him on tape and he's guys aren't just beating him over the top, guys. Right. He's carrying guys across the receiver uh, – the, the formation, but at the same time it's like – okay, well, he's not running this 40 well. How do you, I guess maybe as, I guess Brian's the better person to ask, but in general, guys, how do y'all separate those things from what you see on film? I think it's specifically interesting with Lassiter because I've I've liked what he could bring from a nickel perspective. And if, if there's trouble with speed, then you have to think about guys he's covering, you know, with the Tyree kills and, and you can even talk about the CD Lambs as far as speed goes, but um, you see those fluid hips, you see that uh, that the transition and his footwork. That's why I think he could be a better nickel. But as far as long speed goes, I, I think at the corner position, you don't want to sacrifice that as much as you maybe would with the safety position. That's fair. You know, you look at a guy like Cameron Kitchens, who I have been high on in the process, did not have a good combine as far as testing goes and um, uh, explosion uh, testing goes with his broad and his vertical. That stuff gives me a little bit of concern, but it would give me a lot more concern if he was a corner. Just because mm-hmm. I, I want him to be able to bounce off the line with a really uh, a physical receiver or a really speedy receiver, one of the two, and be able to run, run with him step for step. Whereas a safety, I just I, I focus on the instincts more than I would focus on the athleticism. The athleticism needs to be there. It's football, but I, I would focus on the instincts a little bit more. I think there's a little bit more flexibility there at the safety position. Okay. And with Laster, I, I think he shows instincts when you watch him play. Like the Absolutely. one thing I do in my, have in my notes, which might be somewhat okay, that is a red flag with the speed, is he does get a little grabby downfield. And maybe that's a guy starting to pull away from him with that deep speed. And he'll start to yank a little bit to make sure that he doesn't create too much separation. But overall, I mean, Brian, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but I always am just going to go back to the film. What did I see on tape? I think there's a difference sometimes between testing speed and game speed. Some guys just don't test really well. Other guys will test well, and then that doesn't always translate. If you're able to marry the two, that's awesome. But if a dude doesn't test well, I'm going to revert back to what did I see? What were my notes when I went and watched him play? I care more about what you do with pads in game on the field than what you're doing in your underwear Olympics. Mm -hmm. I built this into my notes because I said that I thought he played with more quickness than he does speed. So I knew going in that this guy probably wasn't going to run all that well. But he wants to take contact early. He wants to try and be disruptive. Yeah, Yeah, that's his whole idea. I have the same problem with King from Penn State. Mm -hmm. I'm watching this guy play at a very high level, cover people, doesn't run particularly well. But then all of a sudden he runs a 4-1-6 short shuttle, 20 shuttle. So now I'm thinking, okay, the guy's got lateral agility. He's got some quickness to his feet. You know, I can deal with that. But, man, it, it is, it, it's, it's a difficult situation you deal with. Uh, Johnny Wilson, the, the tall receiver from mm-hmm. uh, Florida State, he's 6'6". It's rare that you have a 6'. I think Colin Johnson was the last person that we saw in the league that was a 6'6 yeah. receiver. Uh, that uh, I think the Colts took him or somebody like that was in there, but yeah, Jacksonville maybe. Yeah, it yeah. was one of those teams yeah. in the oh, South, yeah. I think. But the, the the thing about it is, you he doesn't run particularly well, but he makes all these plays. So all of a sudden, you start to sit there and you're thinking, God, they play a lot faster than on tape. Then and there's there's some guys that if you put pads on them, they're going to run four six. If you take the pads off them, they're going to run four six. Yeah. You know, so that's some of the things that you kind of have to feel like that you deal with in these drafts. Yeah, because even Darius Robinson, um, Mizzou, he didn't exactly. particularly run a good forty. But yeah. when you look at him on tape, yeah, it's freak just, exactly. He's yes. everywhere. Yeah, so, no doubt. yeah, I just, 
I just want to know what y'all's process of elimination is. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, it's mostly context more than it is evaluation That's whenever right. it comes to running because the evaluation comes on tape. You trust the tape. You trust your eyes. Yeah. You trust your notes like Zach was talking about. You go back and refer to it, and you use it as context as, hey, maybe he will run a 4-6 with pads or without pads. Yeah. But, hell, with the pads, he is a phenomenal player. And he's able to play downhill. He's able to show that athleticism. So I, I think it's a context thing. It's all the information that you're gathering along the way that just helps you build a complete picture of the prospect, and it teaches you kind of where I've, you can and cannot yeah, use I, him. I've been in rooms where I've heard scouts, a guy says he can't run, he can't run, he can't run, he can't run. And then a scout stood up and said, I don't care where you MFers put this guy. <laughs> he is going to be a great player in this league. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, you know, guy ends up playing 12, 13 years. Troy Palomalo. <laughs> well, the, sure. uh, there was a receiver back in the day, Florida State, uh, way back, Ravens. Uh, Anquan Arizona. Bolden. What's that? Anquan Bolden. Anquan Bolden. It's a pretty good one. Yeah. Anquan Bolden, uh, Walter Juliff, scout, was like, he did. That's exactly. Walter stood up and said, you MFers can put him anywhere you want. He goes, he is going to play in this league for a long time. And he just closed his notebook and just sat there. And, you know, they put we put him up on the board. And sure enough, he was picked, I think, in the second round. And he played 100 years, yeah. you know. And yeah. 2003 you know, to 2017. There you go. It's insane. Yeah. There you That's go. Wild. And yeah. sometimes you get those guys like that. And you have that conviction of this guy can play. I don't care how fast he runs. Yeah. The tape that we all watch, yep. and that's our only, that's our group's only advantage. I mean, that's our only advantage is we get to watch tape and then maybe an occasional workout. Yeah. But that's what you go off of. And I think, to me, your board is pure that way when you just evaluate the tape. I mean, I had a scout in the league tell me, he goes, do me a favor, when you're done, send me your board. Hmm. And I go, why do you want my board? And he goes, because you're just watching tape. Mm-hmm. You're not worried about all the things that I'm going in and getting from the school. You're, you know, I hear this, I hear this, I see this, I hear it. You're just watching tape. That's generally who these people are yeah. when you watch this tape. It's really interesting. It really is because those guys have so many different factors. They have too many. Too and many clutter them up. And we were just talking yeah, about it in yeah. the opening here. You know, all of a sudden you get these, you start to, you put a guy on a board and mm -hmm. all of a sudden you have this, well, he looks smart on tape. Okay, and then you talk to him, and you're like going, wait a minute, he doesn't understand concepts yeah. Yeah. here. And that that affects. If a coach doesn't feel like they can get to a guy that he's going to make mistakes, we saw that with this team last year with uh, Adoga. Yep. When, you can't sure. make, uh, when you can't make blocks or you can't get things lined up the right way, they won't play you. This, that, that part of it is a big factor. Yeah. And they're going to have to make some replacements, too, in the guys that they lost based yeah. off of some of those decisions that were made in free agency Mercy. and the way they let them walk. I, I've got a little bit of a game here. We'll, we'll take about 10 minutes on this. But I've got six names that have departed from the Dallas Cowboys. I want you to tell me the most likely draft prospect to replace these names. And this could be your own opinion. We could come to a conclusion if we want as a group. But more likely, I want names that can be realistic replacements for each of these guys that have departed the Dallas Cowboys in free agency because, frankly, there's a lot of them. <laughs> and a lot of them that were impact players. We're going to start on the offensive line. We're going to get it out of the way because this is probably the most likely day one, day two picks. Uh, we'll start at offensive tackle. Tyron Smith departs. Zach Wolchuk, who do you feel like is the most likely offensive tackle replacement? Yeah, I kind of think as we've gotten closer to this uh, at 24, if they do address that in the first round, I think Guyton from Oklahoma seems like the most likely candidate. I mean, I would love me some Jordan Morgan out of Arizona. I've got him graded higher. I do wonder, because I think we heard this with the Cowboys when it came to Rashawn Slater that they viewed him as a guard and not as a tackle. And maybe yeah. it was the short arms. And I wonder, because Morgan is similar in that regard, if they would take him and say, all right, we feel comfortable playing you at left tackle. I think Morgan is a better player on tape. Mm -hmm. I think Guyton is raw. There are talented traits. He's big. He's got long arms. He can get to the second level. Uh, for those that maybe, yeah, we have talked about him quite a bit, but transfer from TCU, played at Oklahoma this past year. Yep. I think he can play left or right side. He's got some versatility on that regard. Uh, six seven. He's got room to fill out. I think the technique can be a little bit sloppy. He can get overpowered at times, but at 24, and we've seen if the Cowboys say, all right, uh, like with Tyler Smith, who a lot of people thought was a project, but they see traits that they like that they can mold. 
Guyton kind of fits that a little bit for me. I wonder if at 24, if he's the best offensive tackle there. To me right now, he seems like the most likely replacement. I'm torn. I'm torn on whether they're going to, and we kind of talked about it before the show started, um, if they're going to move Tyler back to tackle yeah. and then just go get a guard maybe not in the first round, maybe in the second or third round. Do you think they need to get a guard? Because I think we – I feel T.J. Bass can be a plug-and-play left guard. I'd rather just address center. I agree. And then we can just go for depth pieces behind that. I agree. I struggle with that because, personally, I just think uh, the depth is just – it's invaluable to it me. Is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. You're right about that. There's no question. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and, again, I do think he's capable of being a starter. I don't mean I want to be one – right now mm -hmm. unless he just outright earns it which is he could but I that's the thing that tears me do you think that Guyton could play guard Guyton no no I think, I think Morgan. his body tap Morgan I Morgan think could kick play, and play guard track. Guyton I think needs to probably stay at tackle, tackle. I don't see the bend there like you do for Morgan I think he's a little too stiff in the lower body to kick inside so you guys are comfortable with a rookie left tackle yeah. Yes. Just because. Do, 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 do. Yes. Just because if, of if the, their history. The, the history here of, of this organization, first round offensive tackles have been plug and play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that that is that is something that you know you can fault them for some things, but everyone that they've ever addressed as a first round offensive lineman seems to have worked out for them. And uh, you know, but we saw a poor draft last year. We've always talked about them about being a great drafting team. You hope. You hope that this is not one of those times that all of a sudden that that doesn't hold true. I struggle with that too, though, because I'm just like, there's other skill players that are there. there if, if, if there's other players there, you know, betting on the fact like, oh, if I get a first-round talent, then, yeah, I mean, I'll that's you, great. But Yeah, I'll tell you what happened, though, Aisha, and I think you know this. All these players that went out the, out the door, they lost their flexibility for best available player. Boom. Mm -hmm. It hurt. Yeah, you you now you're now there's two things you need to think about in this draft: addressing your needs and how can I get a fourth round pick. Yeah, that's a that, crappy place yeah. to be in. And, that, and you seriously, that and that's yeah. and that's where all of a sudden you start to say maybe the level of the tackle that you want to take is not there. Maybe okay. it, all of a sudden now you're saying, well, yeah. we got to grab a center here, and there's gonna be somebody on your board when you get to 24, and you're gonna look down and you're going. I got this linebacker graded higher. Yep. I've got this wide receiver graded higher. And then you're gonna have to. Ooh. And you can't you're take gonna them, and, and you're gonna have to. I think I think up. the way that free agency went for this team, and I'm sure somebody will walk down the hall and hit me upside the head with a board and say, "No, no, you're wrong." I would but love no. for that to happen within the next 40 minutes. Yeah, so we can get <laughs> but, it on camera. But, but see, <laughs> that's what I'm saying though. I just feel like they've lost their flexibility for best available player. You yeah. can't take C.D. Lamb in this draft. Not anymore. Because people go, well, what are you going to do Why? at center? Yeah. What are you going to do at left tackle? Why? What are you going to do at linebacker? That's how you end up with a bad draft class, though. Because you're see, right. I agree with you. But we, you, the, you draft for need. That's how you end up. Teams draft for need. Teams do draft for need. You draft best available player with based on your need. need. So they're going to hope, and that's why I think the Tyler Smith moving to tackle spot could be. What if the right, the correct tackle is not on that board? Sure. Now maybe you sudden, don't like Mims, Morgan, yeah, yeah, Guyton. Yeah, maybe but you like Barton Mims. or Powers yeah. Johnson. I will say this about Guyton. Okay, and I learned this working in that room with Jerry Jones. If you tell him he reminds you of somebody he knows, mm, it will done. make sense. Someone in that room is going to say Flozell Adams to him. Ooh, okay. Somebody's going wow. to say a 6'8", 300. Barton? Uh, no. no Tyler, Guyton. Tyler Guyton. Tyler Guyton. Okay. Guyton. I was like. Somebody is, yes, yeah, somebody <laughs> is going to, in that room, if they know better, is going to mention the name Flozell Adams. Huge man, athlete. Played guard, played tackle. You know, he he was fires off the ball. Nasty yeah, exactly. In the run game. Yeah. See, that's that's what Jerry understands when you tell him, "Hey, boss, he reminds me of this guy," and all of a sudden Jerry starts looking over the top of his glasses, like, "Hmm, okay, I see what you're talking about here." You know, so that's how you sell Guyton to him, I believe. But the, the flexibility of taking Aisha's best wide receiver or best corner off that board. Now, corner maybe. Maybe you can take the best corner and you'd be okay. But if you take a wide receiver, what if that tight end got to you? Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, there's – If Laiatu Latu is there, are you taking him? 
That's what I'm saying. You need to replenish. Edge. See, we t- Nick you and do. I talked about you that on Thursday. You just lost both of your. I would, you can't I play would no kill games. you for that one. Because because Brian, you've taught me don't window dress that board, nope, right? No. So it's like in the right situation to, going into the no, draft. To me, that's I don't the think thing. That, I don't think that you can view it like that. I don't think my my view of team building. You don't tell is, them they're. Gonna, you don't think they're going to stack their board with all their needs in the top then, of that board. Then you're window dressing your board. Well, they have to. They have no choice. They got to make sure that they get the guys that they want. But they are a football team where their only way of team building right now and they can disagree and that's totally fine but what they've proven over the last few years is we are building through the draft your same needs that you have right now aren't your same needs you're going to have next year and we're you're drafting you aren't drafting for this year you're drafting for four you're drafting for five years now when they took cd lamb was he a need pick no he ends up being one of their best picks of the last decade and where would you be without him right now so if i take lie to law to and he's the best player on my board and yes i'm desperate for a center yes i'm desperate for a tackle four years from now are you going to look back if law two hits and say damn that was a bad pick we really should have taken probably the tackle not the no and that's how good teams draft and that's why this team's been a good drafting team you get in trouble when you take a mozzie smith sure who doesn't pan out and maybe he still will i'm not losing out I'm just an example right now yeah but because oh we really need to help our run game we really need a big defensive tackle that's how teams end up taking the wrong players because they go ahead and draft for need and they don't take the player that they graded the best i agree with you and i think if you take a player player like that in a position like that then you're good you take the best player on your board he's probably going to end up being one of the better players because you evaluate him you trust him and whatever that ends up being but the one thing you said in that whole monologue is the fact you said desperate Mm -hmm. they are desperate in a couple of spots whenever cd lamb was taken they weren't desperate in a couple of spots there were some spots sure that it was probably a bigger need than wide receiver they should have used an edge they were rusher pretty desperate for an edge there. they were desperate i wouldn't say desperate though because they still had tank lawrence they still had some pieces that they had already invested so in I, like a dorance armstrong you don't think there's a scout in that room that'll say like oh we got tj bass we got brock Hoffman. we can line up and play if we had to are we desperate Yes. So we're, we're so desperate that gonna, we're going to reach Maybe for a player. I got a guard. two on, and I'm not going to take a one. I think you're – just oh, It's a bad strategy. It I is a bad strategy. Like that's where you move back, though. That, that's that's where you had the flexibility of picking up that fourth we can We can go ahead and move back. <laughs> I'm yeah. okay with moving back. We can do back. that. Yeah. We, can, we can trade back. But my question, though, is when you're drafting – you say you're you're against drafting for need. Let's say you are drafting for need, and you need to be able to do that. You need to have trust in your scouting department. I don't think it, you'd be hard pressed to find another organization that trusts their scouting department more. Than but a lot of that. pressure and, and on those guys. And a lot of pressure so. on those guys, and, and especially you, coming after and last year. You put year. more pressure on them if you're going to overdraft a player when those scouts said, "Hey, this guy's clearly better," and now we're going to go ahead and take X for need and pass on a guy that we have evaluated. Oh, they're for not going to jump tags. They're going to make sure all those guys are in line up there. <laughs> yeah, you got something I saw. And you I'm not there. against drafting for need. I'm just against yeah. doing it when we clearly it's have a better player that is there that is sure. slid just for the sake of drafting a need pick would if you be close, over drafting jordan morgan tyler guyton amarius mims or it you depends on who else is there i mean okay. that, 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 that's this. it really just depends on who else would be sitting there yeah they just don't have the luxury to me with how the draft went last year to not be Very aggressive yeah. and to not you need contribution from your top three picks at the very least immediately you so wouldn't the, get a contribution from an edge if you drafted it. You would. That's what I'm or agreeing with. I'm agreeing with you. 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 I'm agreeing with you right I hear now. You. Yeah. <laughs> He's but on the defensive. I know. I'm like, Lord have mercy. I ain't have to get you. I feel the same way. I think they have put themselves in a bad situation. Bring it. But a lot of it has to do with the lack of contribution from your draft picks last year and not Absolutely. knowing what they're gonna be because. Quite frankly, we're talking about tackle. We have no idea what Awesome Richards is. That's right the now. problem. That's very true. That's the problem. No idea. But maybe they do. And maybe that yeah. maybe that may play into kind of what you were talking about with TJ Bass and Brock Hoffman. They might be like, well, maybe we can get a receiver here because they do have faith in what mm-hmm. Awesome has. We it just don't have that issue right now. Aisha, I agree with you to a point. Right. And the, the point I, I would think I would feel a lot better if I knew what Awesome Richards was instead of Chuma Adoka. Playing tackle, I agree. But and I don't I mean, get it. And I, and I know, asked? and I know what Matt Willetsko is. Has asked? He's got his, he's got his shoulders getting fixed. Okay, yeah. I think Matt Willetsko is a tough guy and all that. He just hadn't played. But I don't know if they could tell me what they know about Awesome Richards. You know, and maybe, like I say, you're right. Maybe they've got it all squared up. I wish they would have played Awesome Richards then, oh, and that way I would have feel better about it. I do know I've seen their left guard play at a high level at left tackle. Mm-hmm. I've known that. Yeah. I, I'd seen that one with my own eyes. 
Are you in the mindset though? I, I'm in the mindset of wherever they put him this year. That's it. Just leave him there. Yep. I'm with you. I think they can move him one more time, and then you're you're done. I'm <laughs> over <laughs> it. You're staying. Stay put, Tyler. It's not even me, and I'm over it. Yeah. I'm <laughs> it's over not it. even me. All right, we got through a whopping one position through this game. <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> no, I liked it. I loved the conversation I'll because t- it I'll is take a the debate. Blame. I'm sorry. It's a debate that will rage on from now and then 37 days later in the NFL draft when the war room is lit up across the hallway as we, it normally we is. We could do a quick fire round. Just go like. We're going to go yeah, we in. Can. We're going to push it into player. the second segment. Okay, that's what right. we're going to do. Let's do a fire We're going to push it into the second segment. We're going to get to <laughs> the rest of that <laughs> <laughs> when we come back with more of the draft show right after this. I'm Dak Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And they snap at the Prescott who looks right. It's not there. He escapes left. He'll run for a first down. Just like football, when it comes to crypto, it's important to have a team you can trust. With blockchain.com, I know I'm in good hands. Since 2011, they've been trusted by millions around the world to buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrency. Prescott's going to run this himself. Run it up the middle, and he scores. Whether you're new to crypto or an active trader, they've got you covered. What are you waiting for? Get started at blockchain.com. I'm Darren Woodson, former Dallas Cowboy player and Super Bowl champion. When I played in the NFL at a high level, I relied on my vision to see the field. As I started getting older, I noticed my vision wasn't as good, and I was getting frustrated from wearing my glasses all day. I went to Laser Care Eye Center, and Dr. G talked about all the options. Thanks to technology and Laser Care Eye Center, I can see near, far, and between. Don't fumble your vision any longer. Visit them at dfweyes.com and tell them Darren sent you. They got me back on my game. In a stressful world, Lincoln provides balance and calm amidst the chaos by creating sanctuaries that move you through the world with ease. Our vehicles make your time richer and more uplifting with human-centric design, intelligent technology, and powerful performance. As the official luxury vehicle of the Dallas Cowboys, driving a Lincoln is just another way to show your team pride. Experience our full lineup of luxury vehicles, including the Corsair, Aviator, Navigator, and Nautilus at Lincoln.com. Hi, I'm Danny McRae, Dallas Cowboys alumni player here with Smoothie King. And Smoothie King wants to ask you, what's that sound? That's the sound of us magically transforming our smoothie bowls into two new decadent flavors. Dig into a cool acai or pitaya bowl handcrafted with crunchy, purely Elizabeth granola, fresh strawberries, and finished with a velvety chocolate hazelnut drizzle. Perfect for breakfast, lunch, or anytime you want to munch. And that's the sound of you making them disappear. Smoothie Bowls, now in two new decadent flavors. Only at Smoothie King, the official smoothie of the Dallas Cowboys. This this is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Their first rounder. (laughs) Kenny Chesney is bringing his Sun Goes Down Tour 2024 with Zach Brown Band and special guest Megan Maroney and Uncle Cracker to AT&T Stadium on May 11th. You can chuckle all you want, but tickets are on sale now at SeatGeek.com, the official ticketing provider of AT&T Stadium. Is that your? I'm biting my tongue. Is that your your level of music? By the way, by the way, I will not be able to make that one. The sun goes down. You you know that one? (laughs) They'll be. Yeah. I don't know, man. Okay. All right. We're just gonna keep on rolling. (laughs) I saw somebody lose their job over this. Don't say a word. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm not gonna comment. I will say I do like Kenny Chesney. I I do like Zach Brown Band. (laughs) I've seen Zach Brown Band live before. They're very good. Is there yeah. a popular It'll be a great song? show, folks. Go yes. check it it's out. Go be check a it out. Seatgeek.com. Check it out. Show. Have fun, everybody. May 11th. There'll All be right. 90,000 people there just letting you there know. There definitely crazy. will be 90,000. That's crazy. There's 90,000. That's crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The foot draft. Draft. <laughs> That's Football. crazy. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> I want to get to the rest of these positions that need to be replaced for the Cowboys. We got through offensive tackle. Thanks, Zach Wolchuk, for starting and sparking that debate. Nah, well, we ha- I thought it was a fun conversation. It was a very fun know, conversation. Cool. Well, I'm going to start with you on this one, yeah. Aisha. Tyler Biotish is gone at center. Who's the most likely draft prospect to replace him? Um, oh, gosh. If they're picking in the early rounds? It, wherever you feel like the value fits best. Do you guys have a first on Cedric Grand Prix? No. No. No, no. I have a third. I think I, I, had, a, I had a fourth, fourth though. Before combine. If that's what you believe, I go believe, for it. I believe that they would like his temperament, and I do believe yep. that they also would, if they didn't pick a center, I just don't see them picking a center in the first round. No, I would love him as I a fallback I don't feel that option. in my spirit. I'm with you. So, 
um, I think <laughs> I think he's I think he's a respected player. I think people know who he is and things like yep. that. He still can use some polish. I, I think and the, I think this team has started to kind of like that. I feel like they have drafted guys. It's really hard not to look at this last draft, but the drafts before that, you do see that they like some guys that have a little bit of rawness to them that they can maybe polish. I think that Cedric Van Pran is a gentleman that they could take in maybe the third round if they had that option to clear up that center position. Is there any guy in the later rounds that's a center that you guys are interested Hunter in? Hunter Norzad, now? I've talked about out of Penn Ooh, State. Yeah. That I, I like literally that. want him. I, I start We to talked about Tanner Bordellini, although I feel like he's creeping into day two territory for yeah. sure. Can I throw out Mason McCormick, South Dakota Absolutely. State? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think I, I put. Very athletic. Uh, spoiler center? alert. <sighs> I think, yeah, I think he's a guard. Yeah, I think he's a guard. But if you're talking about m- filling some spots, yeah. yeah, maybe move TJ Bass inside. Or Matt Lee out of Miami to. has a little dog to him. Rock off. I, yes. he's, he's raw, but he's got some dogs. I to saw him. him at the Shrine Bowl. Yeah, yeah you're talking dogs. So I got to give Bo Limmer just a little bit of Absolutely. love. Absolutely. Bo Limmer's there. Both. And, and both in the fourth round. But that's another thing, too. Like, mid. opposite, we talked about this the other week. If they don't pick in the third round, I think Bo's a guy that maybe might be there. In the fourth? Yeah. How? I mean, if you pick up that fourth, yeah, if you pick up that fourth, fourth, I think he's he's doing himself too much justice with how he's performed um, as of late. I think that he's doing too, his, he's getting more traction. Bo is, in my opinion, because at first I would have been like, oh, maybe he's like a fifth in some people's eyes, early fifth, late fourth. But the way that he's played and his just his attitude and the way he yeah. can wrestle in there, like that's what people are looking for. Just doesn't quit, man. What I, you got? I want to continue to bang the table for Christian Haynes as a potential center option. You've as well. mentioned him um, before. I I do love that option too. Like if he's, he's a hell of a player. If he's sitting there at eighty seven, you take that. Yeah, I would too. You, you take you him. him. I think before. he I think he comes think off in the second sit round. There? Yeah. I think he comes off late second, but I think once you start getting past pick. 50 55 especially with this offensive line class it's going to be really fluid and i think it's going to it's it there's a lot of shaking around that could happen there i think there's some guys that might might go later than they were expected or guys that'll go earlier than they may, maybe would have expected is so. christian haynes a center though yeah i think he can, I play, think center. He can play center or guard. okay I he saw played play 49 center. straight games at guard yeah so. i saw him play center at the senior bowl i, I loved what i saw and there. he's a smart yeah. player yeah, yeah he is there. really smart player iq pre-snap tendencies he was calling out stuff pre-snap for UConn so yeah that, that's a that's a guy I would want in the, in the middle okay I have another gentleman have you guys watched uh, Garrett Greenfield South Dakota yes okay the, he's a I, guard I don't think he's I don't think I don't I'm not sure if he can move to center but he is a guard that I I think maybe somebody might think about possibly he could play some center just because of how he finishes and how he bounces off the line he's a four-year starter he's just so tall yeah. And I don't he's know very he, tall. He's very tall, very lengthy. I don't know if you want that for a center, but I do think he's a guy that is going to fall, maybe be in the later rounds that people might look at. So There's anyway, so many fun South Dakota State guys. There are so, there and they, fun. They're there are talented, so many, man. They're talented, and yeah. their uh, their technique is very sound as well. But, yeah, um, all right, so we covered a million centers, but uh, <laughs> Cedric Van Pran is a gentleman that I think might be there. He's a nasty guy, right. too, yeah, he's, Van Pran. Tell I me mean, about him a little bit. He is tough. He, I, I, I'll tell you what, and I – I, I love what Aisha's did there because to me, with you know, people not maybe you're gonna downplay him a little bit because he's 298 pounds I think right now. I downplay him for that. But you know, he's a stout guy. He had a little bit more trouble with the power in the Tennessee game than the Kentucky game that I watched. But man, I'll tell you what though, he's got some. His nastiness is impressive, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I think because. When he keeps his feet moving, he can be hard to deal with because he can position, he can kind of wall you off, he can keep you from the ball. But that's that's where, in space, I think he's a nightmare for these defenders to deal with because he gets out in space, he can pull second level. There's a lot of yeah. really positive things about yeah. him as a, as a center. But the thing is, he is 298 pounds right mm-hmm. now. So, you know, we, we probably need to keep an eye on that. I talked myself out of it because I just realized that they need people to play in the third round. And if they think Hoffman is going to be a starter, are you going to use a third round on a center if he's not going to play? Yeah, because right I think he's probably What do you better. believe? What Do you do you think Brock Hoffman's I think they a starter? Tra- I, I don't want to know what they think. I want to know what you think. Do you think Brock Hoffman would be better starting or do you think Cedric Van Pram would be a better starter? I think he's capable of starting. I just – we haven't seen – a whole bunch from him. I th- I like what I saw from him in the few games that he did play, though. Just the firing off the ball. I thought he and TJ Bass worked really well together. Yeah. And I think your interior has to have that temperament. 
Like, and it can't be for play play either. No. Yeah. It can't be like you I'm lost a, a lot of that with Biotis walking out of the door. Absolutely, and I, and even Biotis, like I felt like he had the attitude, but it didn't show up in his play all the time. That's yeah. a good point. So, baby, if you talking, you better be <laughs> firing off that ball the same way you talking. So, I, for me, I think that it ma- it has to match. And with Hoffman, like I feel like his talk and how he, he is attitudinally matches what we've seen for him the times we've seen him play. I think he's people respect him in the locker room, for mm-hmm. what I understand. I think he's capable. But if you can get better there, I think it's just – Depends on if you, you have some you guys brought up, ball. You brought up Van Prant. Give me him all day. Over all right. Ball. Yeah, I agree. Boom, yeah. pow. Yeah, see, I mean, we've talked about these centers and all that. I, I think there's an opportunity here to upgrade. I think this uh-huh. is one of these classes of centers where we named off five guys. And I felt like like every one of them, when you named the guy, I said, yeah. And if Hoffman yeah. is a really good Agreed. backup, you're blessed. There yeah, yeah. you go. And I'm you, sorry. And talk about depth. <laughs> yeah. You sure. talk about depth. You're yeah. blessed. position? Yes. I, I have oh, it yeah. well, real back. quickly. In this entire conversation, I'm kind of shocked I didn't hear any Graham Barton talk out of Duke. Well, I didn't think he was going to be there. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, Graham Barton at 24. You think he could be there at 24? That's my, that is my dream selection. You think he's going to be there? That's why I I didn't say his name. I would love to take Graham Barton at 24 out of Duke. Graham Barton would be outstanding there. Mm -hmm. To me, if you traded back to Buffalo at 28, Baltimore at 30. Picked up the late third round pick. Remember we talked about that before day three starts? That's what I'm looking at. That Frazier's would be my Frazier's my Well, yeah, I mean, either way, I mean, just landing the Rambarton. tackle. Yeah. If you could tell me a tackle you could trade back for or a center you could trade back for. He's going to do it all day. I'm in. I think Zach yeah, Frazier I'm could in. end up being the I'm dude that you trade back for. Uh, I, yeah. I love Frazier. I, okay. I think Give a, me four picks inside the top 100. Yep. And I'm playing. I'm I'm, I'm fixing this football team again. That sounds That's good fair. to me. Yeah. yeah, and another guy to keep an eye on. We we haven't really talked about him as much when we talk about this tackle class. I feel like he kind of gets lost in the shuffle a little bit just because he's he's comfortably a second round grade. But a potential trade back option that you're looking at in that 30 to 35 range. Let's say they end up in mm-hmm. there. Uh, Kingsley Suamataia uh, Su- out of uh, yeah. BYU. Yeah. Um, he's got the guard flex, so you can bring him in and see if he works better at left guard or left tackle. You're able to work him out with Tyler Smith and that instance uh, he's a transfer from Oregon he was a highly touted recruit played a couple of years there at BYU and was really strong first team all big 12 uh I, I like Kingsley yeah. Yeah. I, think yeah. I think he'd be a great fit here I think you're you right. would be too I think so you would be too right from him you're yeah. right all right linebacker Nick Harris go Nick go what do you think? go Nick go. so I, I'm what what linebacker role are we trying to Leighton fill Van Der Esch. here My you got Eric Kendrick so okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you give me a, a true Mike linebacker a true Mike yes okay then I'm giving you Junior Colson. Yeah, yeah, ten Sweet. times out of ten, I easily. Think. Second yeah. round. Don't look at the don't look at the helmet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At all, at all. Yeah, I'm taking Junior <laughs> Colson if he's there at 56. Three absolutely. out of your last four first or second round picks have come from the University of I know. Michigan. They can't wild. help that they got yeah. some players over yeah. there. They right? won a national championship. I was about to say they're, they've yeah. got a ring. It's coming not their for way. play play. Like <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Uh, yeah, Junior Colson probably a day two option. Uh, a day three option that I've, I've st- I'm starting to love a little bit more. The more I, I look into him um, is uh, Jordan McGee out of Temple. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's another one that I like. That was a formal meeting at the combine. Um, Trevin Wallace, we've mentioned him a few times out of I Kentucky. I love Trevin mm-hmm. Wallace. I just watched him again. I this saw past you tweet week. about he's him. He's Kentucky, right? Yes. Somebody yes. talked to me about him because oh, he's athletic. on the list. Yeah, I, athletic I, as hell. He's fourth so round athletic. guy. Where, where's he? Third, fourth round? Where's he? We're probably looking at a fifth. Oh, fifth? Probably just because he's 5'11. Okay. Um, mm. There's probably a little bit of uh, size concerns there, especially when you're looking at it from a Cowboys perspective. You feel like you really need that big body linebacker. Yeah. That's why I go junior. He's Coulson. a little shorter. Yeah. He's a little shorter. So I, But I think he's athletic, free. He's high instincts. Um, he's he's going to be a thirty visit uh, that was reported by Nicole Hutchinson. So uh, you know that's a guy that they're looking at pretty closely too. He sheds blocks well. I think he does a good job in navigating around the trash. Can drop back in coverage. Can play man zone. I think he's really good at filling holes in the running game. Like he plays with his the instincts and his eye awareness. Very, very strong. I mean, in high school, he was a dude that played all over the field. He even returned kicks. State weightlifting champ. Set the school record for long jump. He's kind of just a freak athlete type of dude. Uh, I absolutely love him. I will say, if you want a true Mike, uh, and and maybe it's just because he was hurt, so he's not getting a ton of love, and I know the athleticism's not there, but Tommy Eichenberg from Ohio State. Yeah. Like, in the fourth round, I, I I would just say, you know what? Has he slipped that far? You would? He's, he's just a guy that I don't think is getting a whole lot of conversation right Well, it's right because now. of the— It's because he's a just a guy. 
It's, he's a jag. You know, it's, it's, I, they, I like Hackenberg, but I, I don't think there's anything good. And I'm not going to argue game. that because, I mean, at the athletic traits, there, and I, I put that in my notes. Like, yeah. there's nothing special that allows you with the too. speed, but yeah. he makes plays. Yeah. yeah, and it's unfortunate, too, because I, I think a lot of that has to do with how he's built and just kind of how he looks. But even when you looked at, like, a Jack Campbell last year who yeah. has that kind of bulky yes. build and things yeah. like that, he still had – more coverage ability to me. He yeah. still yeah. was a more fluid mover yeah. and things like that. We got to see it this year. So to your point, I don't know. I don't know if I. I, I don't know if I would take Eichenberg. I think that day three you wouldn't. I don't even on know. I don't even know because yeah. I feel like what is he even going to give you on special teams with his lack of movement? Because you know these young guys going to have to play. Oh, he's and got that's a screw loose, that guy. He'll run down and cover some yeah. Well, there's yeah. a part – okay, well, uh, okay, then correct me then. But no. that, that's a part of it that I do think is important is to also realize they've lost pieces on special teams too. Yeah. yeah. And I felt like they took a step back last year in coverage and things like that. So some of these guys that we're talking about that are like, okay, well, are we going to – are these gonna guys, these linebackers, these guys going to come in and play early? I'm like, yeah, baby – they need to be able to run down field and cover, too. If you're going to take Jack Campbell from Iowa from last year, take Peyton Wilson from North Carolina State. Oh, mm. What? You think so? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because he, he is. Well, Wilson's he was, faster. Jack had injuries, too, yeah? Yeah, yeah. a little bit. I don't know about the extent. Not the, not, not the not extent. Nearly yeah. Yeah. Not the extent, Wilson. but I'm just saying <laughs> the same kind of player. Questions. You want a player that can play downhill, can cover, fill gaps. That's I mean, to me, I'm getting to the point now with – I'm. This is gonna sound terrible. Is yeah, we ready? Say it. This thing. I wonder with the injury history with Peyton Wilson, if he is going to be one of those guys that you're sitting there in the third round and he's still there. Mm. And you're Aww. wondering why he's still there. You know why he's there. I mean, you know, you why, know why, why he's draft there. Room. You, you know, know why, why he's draft there. Room, but and outside. I guarantee you, there's gonna come down to we're getting close to Dallas's pick there at at in the third round, and, and Peyton Wilson will be on the board. And we're all going to look at each other and go, do we have the guts to do this right now? Somebody's going to take a chance on him. I'm you think, sorry. And he'll probably end up being a stud. Somebody's going to take a chance, man. If you're the one that's man. pushing the button, if you're the one that's that turning kid the is, card. You want, a, you want a linebacker that plays with his hair on fire? Yeah. That is Peyton Wilson. He's yeah. the best and linebacker he, in the draft. He's got nothing probably <laughs> left is. in his knee. He's the best linebacker in the draft. I got him He second. would be the first off the board. Who's that's somebody's? what I'm saying. If we, if we, we would all say that he's – we would all say in the third round that he's the best player. 100%. I mean, I, I'm not speaking for you, Aisha. I'm speaking for myself no, here. I, I agree with you. <laughs> you, know, you can but, talk for me on that. Yeah. But, I mean, this guy is so complete in the way he plays. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it, Dallas has a history of doing this, and it kills me because they get four or five years, six years out of a guy, and we saw it yesterday, mm -hmm. Leighton Van Der Esch, you know? And he had an injury history coming out of Boise, you know? And it caught up. We've had it happen, several Cowboy players, linebackers. But you know what? In the third round – if I wanted to go get a linebacker that was still sitting there, Peyton Wilson still sitting there from North Carolina State, hand that damn card in, please. I'm going to fight for that one, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to take our second break. When we come back, we haven't talked a lot about the cornerback class. Mm. We haven't talked about some of these DBs. I want to do a positional spotlight. Good luck with that. Who stands out? Where is the value? Any late risers among this cornerback class? When we come back right after this with more of the Draft Show. Hi, Drew Pearson, former Dallas Cowboy and now Pro Football Hall of Famer here. If you're struggling with your vision and tired of those contacts and glasses, don't throw a Hail Mary. Go where I went. Laser Care Eye Center, the official LASIK partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Drew, thank you so much for trusting us with your vision correction procedure. At Laser Care Eye Center, we offer six different vision correction procedures to help patients see. Check them out at dfwis.com. Tell them Drew sent you. Hood, hood. In a stressful world, Lincoln provides balance and calm amidst the chaos by creating sanctuaries that move you through the world with ease. Our vehicles make your time richer and more uplifting with human-centric design, intelligent technology, and powerful performance. As the official luxury vehicle of the Dallas Cowboys, driving a Lincoln is just another way to show your team pride. Experience our full lineup of luxury vehicles, including the Corsair, Aviator, Navigator, and Nautilus at Lincoln.com. I'm Dak Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And they snap it to Prescott, who looks right. It's not there. He escapes left. He'll run for a first down. Just like football, when it comes to crypto, it's important to have a team you can trust. With Blockchain.com, I know I'm in good hands. Since 2011, they've been trusted by millions around the world to buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrency. Prescott's going to run this himself. 
Run it up the middle, and he scores. Whether you're new to crypto or an active trader, they've got you covered. What are you waiting for? Get started at blockchain.com. Hi, I'm Danny McRae, Dallas Cowboys alumni player here with Smoothie King. And Smoothie King wants to ask you, what's that sound? That's the sound of us magically transforming our smoothie bowls into two new decadent flavors. Dig into a cool acai or pitaya bowl, handcrafted with crunchy, purely Elizabeth granola, fresh strawberries, and finished with a velvety chocolate hazelnut drizzle. Perfect for breakfast, lunch, or any time you want to munch. And that's the sound of you making them disappear. Smoothie Bowls, now in two new decadent flavors. Only at Smoothie King, the official smoothie of the Dallas Cowboys. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. This segment is brought to you by your Texas Ford dealers. Ford is the best in Texas. It's the Draft Show presented by Miller Lite. Taste you can depend on with Brian Broaddus, Aisha Morrison, Nick Harris, Zach Wolchuk. I'm Kyle Yeomans. All right, Aisha, I'm going to let you start things off here. Positional spotlight time. It's time to take a deep dive into the cornerback spot. Who stands out to you? Are there any names that we should keep an eye on? Yeah, um, y'all, you know, you can't say a Michigan player's name without people getting upset. But, okay, I – Mike Sanders still mm -hmm. got mm -hmm. it. Okay, got cool. A uh, quarterback, a uh, cornerback, Michigan. Um, I watched him last night, and we were talking about it even on the break. This is this might be the best nickel corner in this draft. He's so Preach. He's he's. It's interesting how he's able to stay square and bend. He's not the biggest, um, but he comes downhill and he plays big. Very he plays willing, like a linebacker very, in a DB right? body. He's a little nuts. Uh, yeah, he does. <laughs> very willing tackler. This gentleman started as a receiver, and I think you can see that in some of how he plays his keys. And um, he has vers versatility. I think he can play in multiple uh, defensive coverages. I think he can do more. Um, I don't know 100% about the functional play strength just now, but I know he has a good feel. I think he's a zone fit. I, I know he can play man, um, but I think he could grow there. And obviously, converted from wide receiver, it is going to take him some time to get a little bit more feel for that. The short area quickness is there. The burst and the acceleration to make plays, you know, on the ball. The play recognition. If you listen to some of the guys from even talking about the Senior Bowl, they were saying that he was calling out plays as they were getting into yeah. them. So the, the IQ is high with this gentleman also, too. Um, I I think his transitions are things he can still work on. Again, this is still a somewhat raw player, but he just doesn't play that way. He plays with patience. He's exciting also, too. When you watch him, he bounces off the tape to you. So, um, I, I again, we talked about him playing nickel. I do think he has shown the ability to be able to track the ball and to not panic downfield when he is attacked down field but I think this gentleman could thrive as a nickel corner and really really make it difficult on some some of these receivers uh because he plays with he gets his depth he gets his leverage he's just smart Quick, so smart aggressive yeah, he's scrappy a, he, yeah it's a lot of he has upside and that's exciting because when you watch him you're already like dang this dude can play but the yep. fact that he has upside and room to grow yeah. makes him very intriguing um yeah Five Next nine, five nine, one eighty two. Yeah, think that's probably where the biggest concerns do lie. But mm -hmm. you, you mentioned him starting his career at Michigan as a receiver, and typically when we talk about guys that start their careers as receivers in college, there's uh, it's like okay, yeah, you know that's what he was recruited as, but he couldn't really find his placement on the depth chart. Hey, let's try you on defense. Oh, you're really working there. That wasn't the case with Sanders Steele. Mm -hmm. He was productive as a slot receiver. He was uh, for the Wolverines in his first two years. They move him to the defensive side, and he brings a receiver's knowledge to that defensive side because he's able to anticipate certain routes. Yeah concepts he's really good as a nickel because he there's so much that you have to account for right there in the middle of the field as a nickel and he knows what those receivers are trying to do he brings a wealth of knowledge there had a pretty good combine too four four seven forty forty inch vert ten eleven on the broad um i i love sanders still really do i'll tell you what you got that guy nailed both you guys great job on that this guy is for old school people this is ronde barber from mm, the yeah, old I tampa bay that. buccaneers because this guy will blitz off the corner. You put yep. him in the slot, he will hammer your ass. He does yeah. have uh, and you know, and he has a timing. He has a sense of of uh, how to make it work. He plays very aware. Uh, he's you know, when you watch him, he's always going to put himself in position. I'd like to see him get his head around a little bit quicker. Sometimes I think that you know, early in the season, that was a little bit of a problem. Towards the end of the season, you saw some improvement there. But there's some quick feet to him. There's some smoothness in the way he plays. I love the way he plays in the slot. I think that's his best spot in the NFL. He is an outstanding blitzer. And if anybody knows about Rondé Barber from the old Tampa days, mm -hmm. you put him in the slot and the nickel, you blitz him, and he was always coming up with a turnover. This guy's a similar type of player that yeah, way. He's awesome. 
I'm going to give you a, uh, a a guy that I'm really starting to pay attention to that I think is going to be getting a lot of love here late in the process. Elijah Jones out of Boston College, uh, mm. six foot one and a half, 185 pounds, more of a slender frame, but um, he blew the combine away with a four 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 forty, forty two and a half vert, ten eleven on the broad, and he was he turned a lot of heads after after Indianapolis. Went back and watched him a little bit more. I got to talk to him a little bit in Indy two. Uh, this is a smart smart player. Um, and he he plays with it on the outside. Uh, he's he doesn't do anything spectacular, but he does everything good. Mm-hmm. And I I I, uh, I I really love what I saw from Elijah Jones. I think he's a guy that's going to be valued more and more as this process goes on. Um, he's he's a guy that a team would love to have at, at, at the boundary. First word I saw on his report: instincts. Mm-hmm. I haven't watched him yet, Smart. so I'm just looking at on online. But uh, uh, Zerline, who does a great job on NFL.com, says instincts. That's the first thing you pop up. So when you say he's a smart player, that's something yeah. there. You compare that it's, instincts it's with athleticism. I'm writing him down right now. I'm going to go back and watch him tonight. Me too. Zach, who you got? Man, there's so many different corners you could go with here. Andrew Phillips comes to mind. I'm going to go yeah. with uh, Kyrie Jackson out of Oregon. Yeah, talk to oh. me. Talk to yeah, me. yeah, he's a little bit different to some of these dudes we're talking about. 6'4". You mentioned blitzing, and I immediately thought Kyrie Jackson. Led mm. Oregon with three picks last year, That's 10 passes defended. That's a great corner name, too. Yeah, it and, and he he's, is an alpha. Like, he's an alpha, that secondary. Transferred from Alabama, where he spent his sophomore and junior seasons. Played a lot of special teams there with the tidies big long tall boundary corner really good blitzer willing to come up set the edge in the running game can play press zone i think he passes off coverages really well moves and flips his hips he's got fluidity there for its size really good athlete he can get beat off the line in press when he doesn't get a jam or his feet are just a little bit slow to get turned around Uh, i thought jalen polk gave him a bit of an issue there when he gave polk a free release he beats him for a touchdown in the game that i watched him play against washington but Overall, he does a good job of mirroring receivers downfield, and he, he he really does a good job of disrupting route timing because he's so physical with guys. So maybe not great long speed. He's a long strider, but I like the potential of him. I mean, Kyrie Jackson's one of these guys. The confidence isn't an issue. Mm-hmm. Plays with a lot of swagger. I love his play temperament. He's a fun player and was certainly uh, really, really stands out to you when you watch that Oregon defense. Yeah, reminds me a lot of Nation Wright when he was coming Sure. Down. Yeah, especially with the Oregon ties, Oregon, Oregon State. <laughs> What you got, Brian? Jarvis Brownlee from Louisville. Yeah, I like him too. Is a 5'9", 194-pound corner. He's transferred from Florida State. He played boundary corner. And when I say boundary corner to you guys, and you hear that phrase, it means they, they put him into the short side of the field. So they use the sideline as a, a little bit of some help over there. It plays that short side. So, But uh, they also use him in the slot. That he's To me – I love the way he competes at the position. He's really good when he walks up on a receiver and he plays that man coverage. I think he's best when he's like this. I, 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 you know what? The running aspect to him might be a little bit off. The Notre Dame sent a receiver out on the slot that went up and ended up being a touchdown. But I do feel like he's got the quick feet. I think he's got some change of direction. I think he's more than willing to step up and make a play on the ball when it comes to tackling. He's not afraid to mix it up. He's got a good feet to mirror on the outside and stay with the receiver in the short and intermediate route areas and the instincts I like well. And he's got a knack for always being around the receiver and knocking the ball the way. So Jarvis Brownlee, he's a, a cornerback out of Louisville, is a, a guy that I would be like to mention. FSU I'm gonna... transfer, right? Uh, Florida State. Yes. Florida State yeah. yeah. Right? Okay. I'm going to throw out three names really quick, and then I'm going to ask you all a specific question about one of these higher ranked guys that I'd like to get you all's perspective on. A couple of HBCU guys I just want to show some love to. Willie yeah. Drew out of uh, Virginia State. Mm-hmm. Um, he's been training with Mike Sanders still with uh, the great DB trainer, Ja'Cory Nichols, here in the Dallas area. Um, so he's he spent a lot of time in the area. 446 at the Combine for Willie. Uh, he's a guy that's really starting to pick up some steam as far as HBCU guys go. And then you're talking about big guys at corner, Mikey Victor out of Alabama State. 6'3", 209. Um, he, he brings a lot of size to that outside. We talked about Quantes Stiggers um, about a month yeah. ago on this show. I uh, just wanted to update the, the listeners on kind of where he has, where he's at with his journey. Man, it, it sounds more and more every day like he's going to get picked. So yeah. uh, He had his pro day last week. It had a really great showing. 29 of the 32 teams were there. The Cowboys were one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got 10 30 visits scheduled, so uh, a lot of teams really interested in what he has to bring. It just feels like there's more good news stacking with him every single day um out of the cfl in toronto and, yes. and 
Where did he do his pro day? Was it his own? He did individual? it. He did it at his uh, high school that he only had uh, a, a thirty-seven uh, teammates at, or twenty-seven teammates at when he was in high school at the best oh, academy in, 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 that is in, so in cool. Atlanta. This is, yeah, this is awesome. He did it right in between Georgia and Georgia Tech's pro day, so a lot of teams were able to swing through and make it. So uh, it's really working That's out. Great for him. scheduling on him. Yes, yes it, it is. is. Shout out to Smart shout out to his agent Fred yeah. Lyles. Yeah. Uh, we, we've gotten to interact Smart. with him a little bit. Just uh, we're we're doing a big Met feature Fred on last year at the combine. Yeah, yeah. So he's 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 doing a really good job with handling um uh, Quantes stiggers and, and what really he's got cool. going on so uh, the question i wanted to ask you uh, uh about a specific high highly ranked corner i look at nate wiggins uh, out of clemson yeah. really mm-hmm. love what he brings to the table i think he's physical despite him being extremely slender and that kind of leads into my question here came in at 6'1 173 at the combine i know the weight is concerning a lot of people um it's it's kind of the same question that you ask with Xavier Worthy. You know, if he ran a four two three, are we talking about him being 165 pounds a little bit more? Mm. Um, but talking about it on the defensive side, Nate Wiggins ran a four two eight, and we're talking a lot about his weight coming out of the combine. Granted, he came back to Clemson's pro day last week and was 188, but how much of that is you know water weight and realizing that you kind of have to weigh in at a pretty acceptable number for these scouts that are in attendance, and plus you're in your own backyard, you're able to prep for a little bit better, but do you guys worry about having a slender corner in a league today where I, you need to be a little bit more physical than finesse? We did that last year with our Mississippi State kid, Emmanuel right? Forbes. Emmanuel Forbes. Forbes. Yeah. And he had a little bit of a rough year. Yes, yeah. he did. Uh, you know, with dealing with that. And I, I think overall the commanders had a rough year on defense. And, you know, and I'm not putting it all on the kid. I Man, I kind of feel like with Wiggins – I kind of feel like he's a better zone corner than he is a man corner. Said, I'm with you on that 100%. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and that's his style. I mean, that, and, that's and, why this size has been able to work in the yeah, ACC because it's know, also pretty physical. I, I've got the kid in the first round, and I and I did it on the tape that I watched and because I do see a guy with loose hips. I do see top-end speed. I do see him getting moved. His socks move faster than everybody else's <laughs> socks on the field. You can see that on tape. <laughs> And, you know, but, I mean, he'll break on the ball. I've seen him wrap up as a tackler. I mean, the effort was good. So I refu- he refuses to give up on a play, and that's what I really appreciated about the kid. And I, I could see some people, because of the weight, are, gonna, are probably going to ding him a little bit. But I think he plays fast. I think he plays quick. Uh, I think you're gonna, he's going to have to go to the right place that kind of understands that maybe he's a little bit better in zone coverage and in the slot stuff than he is playing man. Uh, also, too, I think it's going to be important with him. I mean, because it is kind of crappy that Emmanuel Forbes happened last year, and that's just kind of clear Fresh on in everybody's brain. mind, yeah. But I also do think that we, we talked about it. It wasn't just – there was a lot of things wrong with Washington's defense. I, yeah. um, I, I think they will get some – coaching better coaching especially on the secondary side of things and that's my thing is with um wiggins is whoever takes him if you are going to put weight on him you have to be strategic and careful in how you do it i don't think you you don't want to take away from his speed and to brian's point he still is coming up and tackling and things yeah. like that it's not like I, I, I don't he know. He struggles to get all blocks is the only thing with that size and that's, but he is willing to come up and tackle and, and he blitzes fair. that's fair so i i think it's going to be scheme fit personally and then also to deciding if putting weight on him is going to be beneficial or if it's going to hurt more because yeah. I think it might hurt more because his speed and his anticipation and some of the things he's able to do because he's lighter is what sure. makes him the player that he is I've got one more name for you mm-hmm. to throw out there I want to see if you guys have watched him yet how about Max Melton I was, I was literally about to bring Rutgers. him up as soon as you really? done yeah. Yeah. I really like him yeah, a lot I have a, Melton, man. a third round grade on him I think he's a twitchy athlete he had a phenomenal combine 99th percentile on the broad jump he was a 4 3 9 from Rutgers, by the way uh, yeah. yes from Rutgers uh, 94 percentile in the vertical physical and aggressive despite just being 5'11 185 so he's got some size to him the length is fine I'm okay with the length it's the physicality and the technique that he puts at this at the line of scrimmage uh i i think there are times whenever his footwork gets sloppy there's times when he he is out of position he bites on the double move but overall i think he's an athlete that you can teach and you talked about growth ability Mm -hmm. aisha with some of these corners i think he's another guy that has all the traits he has some legitimate instincts it's just technique that needs to be sharpened, and he's able to take a step forward and be a really good corner. In the this future. kid, uh, Rutgers, Rutgers. Thank number you. 16, this kid has a knack for blocking kicks, too, if you mm. go back and look at his story. 
uh, that he on special teams he plays he can get up on receivers really really tight and be very disruptive the way he plays, and then you also see him playing zone and he pedals sideways. You know, like he gets like sideways and he's kind of dry and he's keeping everything into the middle of the field. Mm -hmm. So you've seen him kind of play either tight or in a zone and he, he adapts. He really, really does. And he gets his head around. He can locate the ball. His ball skills are outstanding. That's a great name to bring up. He knows how to finish plays because yeah. Yeah. the way he puts himself in position. I mentioned the special teams value there. Uh, I could see him being a nickel and a starter. And because of his aggressiveness, his toughness, I love the way this kid competes. His he brother's really already in the league as well, too. Yeah. Bo Melton, you might remember yeah. him from a couple of years ago. taking all my notes here. Wide receiver. All of in your business. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I love it. I do have one question before we get out of here. A um, couple of corners that I think could have some safety flex at, at the next level. Mm -hmm. TJ Tampa out of Iowa State, mm -hmm. Renardo Green out of Florida yeah, State. Yeah, you better not. Um, I keep not I knowing where to put say Green. Something. I love Green TJ is where, Tampa. I like I Green. Struggle I like Green. Green. You don't want to move TJ Tampa? No, no, I don't no, no. no, no. I know he was going to say Renardo Green. Uh, he was one of the guys yeah. I, I wanted to mention. Yeah. Green is Green is a difficult one. I, I think you that's a guy you bring trouble where you put him? That's a guy you bring in the building and you play him out at some different positions and see what you he mean, works He's going to have a busy corner? training camp. He's going to have a busy, busy <laughs> training camp. I, I kind of have a problem stacking him with the other guys. With the other corners? Yeah. Because he can have do Because he's really, I think he's really good, and but then some of the other guys think might be a little bit better. But then you read your notes, and I'm like, his toughness. The thing that I saw about him that kind of scares me, I think he's a 50-50 guy on penalties. Oh. I think he's a grabby clutchy, you know, kind of yeah. hang on to you guy. And he plays all over the place. He's competitive. He's a great – he's not – he's the type of player – he's not afraid to play you tight. And he's going to compete for every ball. But, man, I saw a grabby drape over the arm back across the receiver's back kind of a play. I think so. he's too fast for his own good sometimes. And I actually put I, – I think he needs to play more under control I, at you, times. I think, yeah, that I, makes and, sense. And it, I, so think, I think you're on to something I there. just think he's so fast that sometimes he's – he he's beating the receiver to the spot and things like that, and wow. so you do you will see early. some of the grabbing. He's too early. Yeah, and the, but well, I'm, I, gonna, I'm gonna send you my board, and you can put him where you think he's. <laughs> but I also, but I do. We did get to see him at the Shrine Bowl, and I felt like he played pretty clean. Did he play? Okay, um, you know what it, it might it be is like he's so smart. I think he's you looking for cues to where he can just jump on routes, exactly. and sometimes he's just he's too early at it. And it's crazy, too, because he has PBUs, but he doesn't take the ball away a lot. So I yeah. think that's also the other side of oh, what no, you're saying. I'm, it's hey, like, if you are going to be like that, ledge. baby, you better yeah. you know make a play on the ball. So I, I, I actually really like the player a whole bunch, um, especially because of what he's able to do with man. And then seeing him battle with neighbors was yeah, that I'm gonna was, I'm gonna have was, him too low. That was dope know, to see. Have him too but low. anyway, no, you're entitled to no, your I, opinion, I, right? No, 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 <laughs> I love it. I mean, you guys are. I think you're right about the player. Oh. I really do. Okay. I had a bad day. I'm gonna talk to you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us here on the Draft Show. That was a lot of fun, guys. Uh, that was a good episode, thanks guys. To, thanks for the Thank debate. You. Thanks for the names. Did a nice job Missed all the way We sunk our teeth in this corner position. Boom. Yeah. Love that. Got some corners talked about. We're going to keep doing some positional spotlights. <laughs> on Thursday. I'm stopping on corners. I'm done. Brian's going to do uh, some Would You Rather on Thursday. There you We're go. Bring back Would You Rather. That was a popular segment from a couple days ago. Thank you, guys. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Have fun with Bobby. He'll ruin rolling. the show for you. Oh. Yeah. I'm just kidding. I love you, Bobby. Although. All right. Cooper Beebe take is garbage. <laughs> he hates him. He For Zach like Wolchuk, him. Nick Harris, Brian Broaddus, Aisha Morris, and I'm Kyle Yeoman saying so long from the draft show. We will see you on Thursday. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys?